Okay, welcome back for session six of uh, CE120B 220B. Today we will talk a little about your integrated design project and some of the things you came up with for exercise one in terms of thinking about building layout. But our goal for most of the day is to really spend our time thinking about the building envelope and specifically about like how some of the analysis tools that are available in Revit. Um, it's pretty easy to go through and understand things like the daylighting levels we're achieving, energy we're expending, and other things like the amount of solar radiation which are hitting our building, which are all sort of considerations that we want to think about when we think about the different surfaces we're trying to put together and our goals, what we're trying to achieve with each of those surfaces, whether it's trying to let a view in or let heat in or protect ourselves from some heat. So there's all sorts of different things we could be trying to accomplish with different services. But we're thinking about how the tools can help us understand if our designs are doing those. Relative to the integrative design project, I've actually met with many of the folks here. I'm going to meet with a couple more <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, in terms of the focus and what we're looking at right now, Again, for the first week, the big focus was uh, your big design ideas, your initial ideas about the form and how the building is going to lay out, all those sorts of things. And those sorts of things are hopefully in your design journal entries, kind of focusing at a very high level. As we move into week two, which is going to be next week, we'll have some check-ins. Um, be thinking about just sort of the passive design features in the building envelope. Some of the stuff we're talking about now how that's going to get incorporated like into your design. So as we think about the different buildings that you've laid out and the different wall surfaces and what way they are oriented, let's think about each of those in terms of how much view do we want, where we're trying to capture that, where we're trying to sort of keep a more insulative space or from a view, a privacy standpoint where you don't want people to be looking through the windows because you want them to focus on a classroom or a meeting or you need some privacy for some of the functions. Like I think, oh, it's kind of interesting in the medical rehabilitation spaces, it might be cool to have windows, but maybe not. You know, it's kind of it's sort of a six and one half dozen in the other there. So thinking about surfaces, the walls, the glazed surfaces, as well as the roof and the ground, how we're interacting with them <laughs> and what they're doing for us. Because if we are thinking about using the roof as a terrace, or if we're thinking about putting solar panels up there, or just trying to put a green roof up there, you know, all these different things are sort of possibilities, and they all have different implications about what you're trying to achieve and like why you're doing it. Because the cool aesthetic, the aesthetic things, we're trying to figure out what their uh, performance on the impact, or the impact on the performance is going to be. Okay, um, for your design journal, most people are doing pretty good with that. A lot. The interface is still clunky. I got to sort of work on that a little bit this weekend. But most people have done a very nice job of getting some text in there and some images, and that seems to be working out okay. If you're struggling with that, please let us know, and we'll try and give you some guidance there. Okay. What I'd love to do just to start out today is just really kind of take a look at the whole exercise one, which some people are sort of at different points in terms of working with. It's really just, uh, you know, it's an idea. It's just something to kind of like work on to uh, just give yourself some fluidity and some uh, experience with thinking about different building forms and how they might lay out. So what I want to do is, you know, no definitive answers, but just sort of fish for ideas in terms of what people have come up with in terms of thinking about these different buildings and where you might think about, or how you might think about them being laid out. So again, we'll sort of dig into it a little bit, not exhaustively, but I just want to sort of see if we can kind of glean any insights from this. So this was the uh, set of buildings that we had for assignment one. How about, oh, just to get ourselves started, let me go ahead and start over here with uh, this building, which is this kind of double diamond shaped building. It's kind of a shape which is very near and dear to the hearts of uh, some of the folks who are in the PBL class, because it's actually one of the shapes that they have available to work with. <coughs> but let's just kind of take a look at that. I'm going to zoom in on up there just a little bit and think about that space. So just looking at this space and uh, these kind of two large wings that are sort of joined in the center. Does the, uh, anyone have any ideas about how you might try to lay this out as a starting point? Just you know sort of what would your strategy be for like, you know, where would you make the lobby, where would you make the hallways? Okay, so, yeah, you can know, sort of think about it just on the fly now. Oh, like Jacqueline, if you were approaching this, how, how would, might you think about doing it? Um, at least I would have a, like, a cross-shaped hallway. 
Okay. Okay, look, now let me think about this. So, so when you say across shape of hallways, let me think about or a that. Plus sign shape. Like in like coming across this way and then coming down like that? Yeah. Okay, super. So something like the hallways on the outside there? Mm -hmm. Okay, no worries. Got it. Very good. And then as you think about then, you know, some of the different features, yeah, like what, where, what sort of places would you put exits and stairways and things like that? some sort of stairway in here. I'm just going to go for sort of a squarish stairway, just kind of like we have in the Y2E2 building. Like that. Actually, my scale is probably way off here, but I don't know. Actually, I should just try a scale. Let me sort of see what the scale of this building actually is. Alana gave us nice big buildings. It gets about 80 feet across there. So if I zoom on in, it probably is a little bit smaller than that. But that's okay. my supersized 10 foot hallways, but it'll get the point. So don't worry about that. It's just we're just uh, thinking about the strategy. So I got some sort of stairway here. Now, can you get away with a single stairway or do you think you need some more stairways in this building? I think I'll need more. Okay. So it'll be around like box and right hand corner. Okay, so you think way down in there? Uh-huh. Okay. So I'll have one over here. Okay, how about that upper corner? Do you want one on the other side? Or, no? Okay. Let's think about how now you're sort of evacuating the building. We're going to use the rule of the, the 250 feet rule. Okay, so somehow we're everywhere in the building. We have to be able to get to something, a stairway within 250 feet. So if I'm hanging out over here, let's say I'm way back over there. So I come zipping on down there, I come on down the hall, and you're probably good. You get there probably within 250 feet. We can measure it. Same way over here. I suspect you're gonna be good there. Looking kind of good there. Over on this side, now this side I actually have kind of a nice option. I could either go out and over to that one, or I can go over to this one. So I'm in pretty good shape over here. Again, here I can either come down or go over there. So I think you're real good in terms of the egress, especially on this lower side here. This one, the only thing I worry about with this one is, well, we just gotta think about kind of how your hallways are organized. It's this person. So they're hanging around over here. Okay, and it turns out that the fire and it's kind of right in here, or something like that, kind of in the hallway or somehow blocking them. So we got to realize <laughs> them. They might have to be sort of a circuitous path to get out there, but always make sure people have two paths. That's the big thing. There's always kind of two things. That's why sometimes you know people will go through and put them kind of at opposite ends or something like that. And in terms of thinking about them, you can put them back in the space like this. When we put them back in the space like this, we have to make sure people can get to the space. So. You know, we'll make sure that, for example, you know, that stairway isn't behind a closed door. You know, there'll have to be a little bit of kind of openness here at the end. You know, whether it's another hallway or it's just a big open office. This sort of feels like a big open office. So maybe that's a good way to think about it. Or there's like a pile of wood cubes on the sides or something like that. So just have to make sure they can get there without any sort of locks and blockages and stuff like that. Okay, very good. So your egress is looking pretty good. How about so for your bathrooms? Where are you going to those bathrooms? Well, I'm going to be right next to those sets of the staircase. Okay, so we do this area somewhere? I think that sounds like a capital idea. So again, whether those are kind of kind of hanging out right here or hanging out on the other side, just somewhere near they makes an awful lot of sense. In fact, 
A really nice thing about this sort of design with your core being in the center is we'll talk about it relative to the structural performance. Often that core can have stiffer walls. The outside walls are often glass or some very lightweight material. The core can be made of concrete or something that's very stiff. So it could be a real lateral bracing element that's helping to support the entire building like right away center. It's a really common thing we do with the cores is so we said of not only have them going all the way from top to bottom, we can make them extra stiff. Like those cores start serving four or five different functions just by laying it out all together. Okay. In the same sense, you got your bathroom in there, you got your stairs in there. You know, if there's an elevator, it's probably sort of there right in the center too. And even if there's some vertical shaft for going, uh, you know, pipes all the way from the basement all the way up, or plumbing pipes running all the way through the building, they're probably in there too. So, yeah, that's actually a really good location for the core, just sort of right in the center. So, any other strategies? Mr. Singh Jai, as you're thinking about this, do you have any, uh, a different strategy, or is that sort of the way you would go? What do you think? Uh, so my, my layout is actually similar to this. Yes. I add another staircase at the upper left. Is that up in there? Yeah. Okay, I think that's a sensible thing. Yeah, there's no harm in having three staircases. That's okay, too. There's cost in there, but... I do sort of like, even in sort of this sort of scenario, what I tend to think about it is maybe this staircase is the one that is primarily used. That's the one that most people come into the lobby and they use to get between the floors. These can be sort of quieter ones that are really more emergency exits, just kind of as needed, but not really need people coming up and down them all the time. So I think that's a very sensible approach. OK, no worries. Let's look at one other. Just to get a sense, oh, preferences. You prefer L or H? Which would you like to talk about? Miss Brittany, which one would you prefer? Yeah, I thought that H was really complicated. It is kind of complicated. Let's try and see if we can figure out what we do with that. Okay, so talk to me about the H. What makes it complicated? Or what do you, th talk, talk me through your thinking. It's kind of hard. You almost sort of need something like that. So, no, you're right. It seems a lot of space is allocated to staircases. It is, but it's, it's kind of true. So let's think about this. In terms of this long leg over here, is there a hallway in there? Or is that just sort of open? Or what do you sort of think about happening on this side? It's a little wider than that side. That's why I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do them separately. So how about the skinny side? Let's kind of look at the skinny side. Even when we get a measurement on it. In Alana's Land of the Giants, it is. She, she knows I'm only picking at her because I'm having fun. I hope. Okay, 39, it's about 40 feet. So 40 feet across there. What? We could have a roof. We had a hallway that was like, oh, seven or eight feet wide. We still have like 32 feet deep, which would be a nice big open plan office. Or we could put a hallway down the middle. Either way, put a hallway down the middle, 40 feet more or less. So, oh, 16 on either side, 8 in the middle, or you know, 17 on either side, 6 in the middle. It's actually, there's enough room for a double hall, either way. So, the idea of kind of a hallway coming on down sounds pretty good. Same thing, I think, probably over there. So different sort of scenarios for handling this. So what you're thinking, maybe a stairway at the end of the hall, down in there? Okay, I think that actually is a very common way we would do it. You'd often have a stairway, oh, it's somewhere down in here. We'll do like one of those stairs, we'll have a landing, come across. Okay, and that's a perfectly valid way to do it. So you come zip it on down there and go on down. You have a little hall opportunity for a window at the end of the hallway. That's a very common way of doing it. Um, another way, although what you're thinking, what you're sort of suggesting is that putting them all four corners feels like a whole lot of stairway. Okay, but you know, honestly, I'm not sure if there's a good way to avoid it on the building. 
because, oh, if I didn't put one down here and somehow you got blocked and couldn't get down to that wing, it's kind of tough. You know, it's really sort of hard to get out. So I think a stairway on the corner, each of the corners may be necessary. Let's just kind of go through a couple of variations on that. This is the stairway coming off the side of the hallway. Okay, that's kind of cool. Let's go try a slightly different variation on it. Sometimes you don't actually like the stairway to be at the end of the hallway because you know, it turns out that room at the end of the hallway is a pretty nice conference room. It's a pretty, it's a nice big room over there. So sometimes you get into varying that a little bit. So another common strategy, which is equally valid, is to think about doing something like this. I'll just kind of take the end and make it a nice room. And then I'll let the stairway be next to that. So the stairway right in here instead. Again, that's perfectly valid as a way to approach it. Okay. Yeah, that way you just sort of get to preserve the end for that nice room. That'll be fine. Again, to meet either one. The idea is it's just sort of at the end of the corridor. So, other ways to do that, you know, you could even do kind of the Y2E2 thing, which is to say that at the end of the hallway, coming on down, there's like an external stair shaft, and that works too. You could say the stairway is actually wrapping around out here. And kind of coming on down. But somewhere, sort of the ends of those hallways sort of make sense. There's really sort of a very interesting issue about this, and I don't have a definitive answer for you. It's kind of good debate stuff. If you have the hallway coming here, and you put the stairway. kind of right here, is that good enough? You know, maybe you could try to service both sides. And then it's a little bit tricky because at some level, you know, you can imagine that's pretty good. You can get to it from one side. It's that whole question if you get blocked on the way or something like that. And actually, I, I can look it up. I don't know what the absolute limit is for how long of a dead end you can have before it's considered to be a dead end. Yeah, because it's <laughs> well, that too. It used to be we had fire escapes, and you went out that way or something like that. But stairs are really, really important. And providing adequate stairways are really, really important. You know, if you look back historically on something like uh, the whole World Trade Center disaster and what happened there, the stairways were really probably the biggest issue involved in why so many lives were lost. And that, you know, when those stairways, even stairways, can get cut off. You know, it doesn't happen very often, but when the stairways gets cut off and you have just thousands of people trying to come on down through a stairway, it's kind of counting on everything moving very, very smoothly. And you can you know, sort of imagine every, the last time you left a rock concert or something like that, you know, traffic doesn't always move very smoothly when a lot of people hit the same space at the same time, especially if they're in a panic and a rush and all that stuff. So all it really takes is like one poor person who is maybe a little less mobile than the other people, or maybe unfortunately trips or falls or something like that, and it just has this cascading effect where it gets really, really bad. So that's why we're just so fussy about this whole issue of stairs and stuff like that, because of all the different things. Yeah, it's nice to create nice buildings, but they have to be safe. That's just sort of rule one in terms of what's going on. Okay. As you're thinking about this building, how about in terms of oh, like uh, services and things like that? Yeah, where would you put an elevator in a building like this? Kind of in the center of the H. I think that's actually a pretty good strategy. So we'll put our elevator. I don't know. It'll be somewhere in here. I'll put some nice central elevators in there. It's actually a nice big building, so maybe I can do that. Put three elevators over there. How many elevators do you need for a building? Yeah, they're all trick, they're all trick questions. It's like, it's all a, yeah, one would help with just the ADA access to get to the second level and stuff like that. But that one really depends on it's getting the service, how much service and how long you're willing to make people wait. So there's not like a hard rule that says, 
you need more than one elevator. It's really just more the level of service you're providing and what those peak loads are. And there's the everyday load, and that's kind of cool in terms of, you know, people wander in and go to their appointments and stuff like that. But you also have that time where there's these peak loads. Like I was at a hotel in Chicago, which is kind of a very kind of tall, slender building. There was a conference going on down in like the basement level. And this really bad thing happened that every time there was a break in the conference, something like that, everyone basically had 10 minutes to accomplish what they wanted to do. So they'd all go hit in those elevators and it just worked incredibly poorly because it really wasn't sized for the peak demand. The same sort of thing I was noticing, I was sitting outside the Wong Auditorium this morning. Um, just, you think about the restrooms, and the restrooms near the Wong Auditorium are actually really large. There's like, you know, eight or nine servers. It's quite large in terms of what's going on in there. The problem is, you know, at that 10 minute break between classes, when a whole auditorium worth of people goes spilling out of there, you know, it's gonna, it could be quite a large surge demand or something like that. And you always have to balance that. You know, that level of service is something that's not uh, required by code, okay, but it's really more, you know, something you're providing just because you want the building to be a nice class A building and really uh, kind of have good services. Okay, so we have those. If I have those elevators there, you know I'm gonna think about somehow trying to figure out a way to kind of get my restrooms in near there. Maybe I'll put restrooms on either side and even put my little mechanical space between those two. Be really tricky there, because that mechanical space will be a good spot where the pipes can run up and down, the drain pipes can run down, any sort of uh, ventilation shafts can move up and down, paralleling what's going on with the uh, stair or the elevator. So you're gonna have that nice compact core. Okay. So cores are a good thing to kind of put them all together. You know, when you can, don't overthink it. And Alex for saying, Chai, when we're looking at your building and the multiple pavilions, yeah, it, it won't neatly lay neat, neat out into one core, but in the different locations where we do put the stairs, we'll try to double up as much as possible the functions there and just kind of like change it around. Okay, super, enough of all that. Let us talk instead about envelopes. Okay, so at a high level, you know, there's all these sorts of, uh, you know, concepts about envelopes. The biggest thing you have to sort of think about as you get going is that you have a lot of options. You know, envelope is actually, it's almost infinite, the number of things you can do in terms of different sorts of walls and different materials that could have all sorts of different properties. You know, we can think about them very much in terms of what they're trying to provide and we have a lot of options for doing that. Windows, the shading features, the roof, even the ground surface, I think, and the way we dress it are all parts of what I consider to be the envelopes, parts of the envelope. So before we actually deal with the analysis, I'd like to kind of think a little about sort of what our design goals are for these different things. You know, because there's some things that are, oh, clearly must-haves. We're going to make sure that happens. And there's some things that are sort of nice-to-haves, okay, but may not be absolutely necessary. You know, we'll try to accomplish them as much as we can, but we may not be able to accomplish all of them. So what are the must-haves for the envelope? If you think about your building, okay, and this shell that somehow separates you from the outside elements, you know, what are, what are the must-haves? What, what must it do if nothing else? So Gustavo, what are you thinking about, like for your LG, your building? You got these walls, these windows, this roof, you know, what, what's, what's it providing for you? Insulation. Okay, so a real good one tends to be sort of, uh, I'll call it insulation or thermal comfort. Which I guess, insulation sort of leads to thermal comfort. How about I do it that way? That somehow, you have a comfortable range, and as that weather gets hotter or colder or whatever than what you're thermally comfortable with, you know, that having a little, like an overcoat, will just help you sort of stay closer to the range that's comfortable to you. That's actually a real good one. What are the other things that are absolutely required for it? Like as you think about uh, Stanford for the past couple uh, weeks and the unusual weather condition we've been having, uh, you know, what would you like your uh, building envelope to do? Yeah, it's all those elements.
And it really is, uh, what we've been experiencing a lot of, and I shouldn't complain about it, is the rain. And no one likes to be wet. Well, I tell you, some people like to be wet, but for the most part, it's not a very comfortable feeling long term, because if you're wet, it actually sort of leads to your thermal problem in terms of what's going on. So that's the rain. Yeah. It can be, oh, if you're in other parts of the country, which are a little uh, less fortunate than we are today. Hang on. We could be trying to protect you from snow. We could be protecting you from just wind. If I were out there on some uh, fantastic, like a uh, seaside site up on a cliff, that wind might get to be a little bit gusty. So I want to insulate you from that. Another element I think about, and I would think about it because I don't have much uh, thermal shading on the top of my head, is uh, the sunshine. The sunshine actually, well actually, if you're, if you're anywhere from uh, near the equator, you certainly know that sunshine is definitely uh, one of those ones where we try to protect ourselves of it, but we have this kind of very interesting, I don't want to say a love-hate relationship, but for all these things, they're sort of positive and negative, and that the sunshine, on the one hand, I don't, probably don't want to be sitting in it all day long at my desk, there are many aspects of it that are quite, quite good. Same thing, the rain, you know, I don't want to be sitting out in the rain, but I'd like to use the rain to kind of accomplish my water needs. Wind, again, I would like to be able to use the wind possibly as an energy source or cooling source, a ventilation source. Snow I have a harder time with. I guess it's a good cooling source. But I usually don't want the cooling at the time when it comes. So, I don't know. Snow may get in, it may stay on my bad list. I've shoveled too many driveways, so. Uh, no, it's not necessarily a great one. Okay, how about the nice to haves? Okay, There's, we definitely want to protect. What are some things that you might want to do with your area building envelope and you hope to accomplish it that you may not be able to, it just sort of depends. Anything sort of category, falls into that category? No? How about, you know, let's say you're near the lake at Jasper Ridge. Okay, and the lake could be a fantastic view over there. Okay, you know, is providing a view of the lake, is that a have to or is that a nice to? What? Nice. That's kind of a nice to. Yeah, we tend to like to have beautiful views. So, views tend to fall into that category. It's interesting. Privacy sort of falls into that category, too. Yeah, I actually have an office on the first floor where the windows are open to the arcade. It's actually very sad, there's these windows, but my office man keeps the shades down all day because no one really likes to sit at your desk and have people walking by looking in the window. You know, it's just this very funny social thing that sort of violates. So privacy would be kind of a nice thing. How about daylighting? Is daylighting kind of a must have or is it a nice to? That's a, it's an interesting one. I could sort of go either way on that. It's certainly very desirable. Okay, but some buildings actually have trouble providing daylighting. If you have a kind of very big, massive building, and security is a big ah, maybe security is another thing in there. Kind of protection from just protection from people. <laughs> it's like. So maybe that's another one. If I think about most homes that I'm working on, a lot of what's going on is just, uh, you know, you're trying to keep uh, not only elements out, but actually uh, undesirable people out at the same time. Okay, anyway, I'm go either way on. Any other kind of nice twos? What would be nice? Anything else? Don't worry, if not, yes, what do you got? Ah, aesthetics are kind of good. That's actually very good. I think you're onto something there. I, I almost would have forgotten that. But no, I think the whole aesthetics is a nice too. I think I could probably find you lots of good examples in about like five seconds on the internet of buildings that didn't accomplish that very well. Okay, but might be incredibly good at doing all these things up here. Okay, so yeah, and it's, it is something nice. It, there really is something you know, aesthetically, in terms of whether it's good looking or it's setting a social tone. I know when Alana was doing her center and she started thinking about using recycled materials, 
there was kind of a social message that was being conveyed as far as that. Afalabi's looking like a doubter. He's not quite sure. <laughs> okay, kind of a whole social example. There's all these different things we do. Okay. But again, think about what your design goals are. So whether it's the rehabilitation center or this community center, like so I think your building's really interesting as sort of a community center that we're trying to get people and teens and people of different ages all energized and back down into the downtown. You know, its facade could make a big difference because it looks like a big brick warehouse that looks very forbidding and like a fortress that'll have a very different impact as you know, making it sort of open so people can see into the cafe or see people playing and having a good time. So your know, facade can have a really big impact on really uh, just how people sort of understand your building and ultimately how successful it is. Okay. After you sort of think about your goals, and it is good to think about your goals pretty explicitly about really which are the ones that are most important to you, because we're going to find that as we're designing, we're going to get torn in different directions. Because sometimes providing fantastic views and good aesthetics sort of starts pulling against our energy efficiency goals. Our energy efficiency goals may pull against, you know, some other thing, maybe we'll have a very tight envelope but it's going to cut down on our daylighting. You know, there's all these different things and there's trade-offs between them. So I want to think about the different sort of systems and we'll think about them kind of oh, with that whole notion of where the trade-offs are in mind. Okay, in terms of the types of analysis that are really easy to do for your building envelope, you know, Revit provides very good tools for doing solar analysis, for doing daylighting analysis, and energy analysis. And well, there's three things that are kind of factored in pretty quickly in terms of uh, thinking about which facade wants to look like. So we'll look at each of those. To get us all started, we're going to go ahead and create a real simple building and just kind of start some analyses running in the cloud because it takes a few minutes for some of those things to happen. We'll just let it go. Okay, so we'll look at solar, daylighting, and energy, but before we actually start doing any analysis, I'm going to switch over to Revit and just kind of create a simple little building in. Why don't you go ahead and create one too? Because there's no reason that yours has to look just like mine. Okay, as we go through and create our new building, I'm going to say new, I could use any of the templates, I'm just going to use the architectural template. Okay, there's going to be a couple things that we're going to need to do as we place different sort of elements, wall elements, roof elements, floor elements, we'll just kind of pay attention to the thermal properties because we want to start thinking ahead to that. Okay, we're also going to go ahead and just make sure we create rooms that are sort of bounded because that's sort of useful too. So I'm going to start with my little wall tool. Actually, I'll, do, I'll, I'll start from scratch doing all the proper things. I'll manage and say let's choose a location. Location is always important. Okay, so for today, I always try a different place. Uh, how about off the lobby? Where should our building be? Uh, <laughs> Dubai. Dubai. Dubai is always a good place. I like Dubai. I've only been there once, and boy, was it hot. Okay, near the coast side, so very hot and dry, but there's probably some humidity stuff going on there too. I don't know, we'll just try it. We'll put ourselves by the coast. Okay, super. We're good. We have a sun location, we have a latitude and longitude, we have a weather profile, we're in good shape. Let's also go ahead and just in the elevations, go ahead and take a, just kind of cut at really what our floor to floor height is. Uh, 10 feet's always so squishy. You know, 10 feet's really hardly anything in terms of a floor to floor height. I'm going to make it 14 feet. Okay, just to give myself a little room for the mechanical systems and the structural systems and things like that. Okay, with that basic framework set up, we are going to start putting some walls down. And to do that, I'm going to go to the architecture tab. Under the architecture tab, choose the wall tool. And let's see what kind of walls we have. That generic wall is awfully attractive for getting started. The only problem with the generic wall is it only has uh, like no thermal properties. So uh, that's not very good in terms of doing energy analysis. Uh, let's scroll on up and see what we have in the exterior. I won't worry about it too much because we can change this later. Let's choose one that does have something. 
How about, oh, let's go brick on metal stud. Or CMU on part. Yeah, yeah, that's on metal stud. That sounds pretty good. That's that exterior insulating foam system. We do a lot of buildings around here like that. Let's try that. Just to check it out to see before we put some down what its properties are. Well, check it out. It has an R value of 66. Now, that's pretty attractive in the scheme of things. Around here, if I was, for example, building a single family home, I could actually use an R value of 13. Okay, so actually about a quarter, actually almost a fifth of what the R value is. This is a very tight system. So actually, let me, I'm going to choose one that's a little less tight so that we have uh, some room to improve. Because EIFS is actually really very, very good. Let me go, let's say brick on CMU. That's 30. OK, that'll have a little room to improve. Actually, I want some room to improve because we're going to show you a tool that suggests where you would, might want to improve. Super. I'm going to go through and change the height to go up to level two, draw my little building. So again, draw any building shape that you want. I'm going to draw sort of a little L-shaped building. People who watch my videos know that I always draw L-shaped buildings. I have no idea why. OK, I got some basic walls down there. They all have the same R value now. That could be fine. If I want to put some doors or windows or some curtain walls in there, I can do that. Maybe I'll do a little bit of that. Oh, how about this? I'll go over to my windows and see what I got. I'll just leave that as a standard size. Even the windows have thermal properties. So as you pull down under the window properties, you'll see this is currently has an R value of like 1.5. So think about that relative to like the R30 of the walls. The walls are about 20 times as insulative. So we're going to lose about 20 times as much energy through these windows. OK. We can change that if we go through and change to a different type of glazing. We can change to a higher R value. But again, I'm going to leave it fairly low right now, kind of the low cost and sort of low performance, because we'll let the, the program sort of suggest to me like uh, what might be the right balance. Because the important thing is it's all a balance. OK, so I'll drop some of these in. I'll put some of these on the north side. On the south side, let me go ahead and put a little curtain wall in here. And to do that, what I'm going to do is, oh, that little trick where I just kind of split off a part of the wall and change it to a curtain wall. So I'll split that and split this. And change those two walls into my curtain wall storefront. This is going to be a very plain sort of thing right now. We're going to learn how to go through and adjust our storefronts. So using the mullions, we can start introducing all sorts of interesting shading features. But there's my little building so far. Not too awfully bad. OK. Now, as we go, there's a couple more things we need to do. I need to put a floor and a roof on it. Okay. And I also need to sort of set up the notion of a room and a space, which will help us understand things about how it's actually going to perform. So for the floor, I'll go architecture, choose floor. See what I got over there. On my floor, I have generic. Again, generic won't have any thermal properties. What do I got here? I got all sorts of wood, and I have uh, concrete on a metal deck. Hmm. I could use one of those. It's not really appropriate for the first floor. Even if I was going to do a slab, let's do this. I'm going to take my generic 12 and duplicate it, because I'm going to make a little concrete slab material. Concrete slab. I'll say it's going to be a six inch slab. Okay, the structure is going to be six inches of concrete. And don't worry if you're sort of falling behind. We'll go ahead and share this if you want to use my building. But if you want to keep going, go for it. Let's see what I got here in terms of concrete. Cast in place. Super. Now you'll notice that my concrete cast in place 
Yeah, it has nice good thermal mass. That's going to be great when the sun comes in. It's going to bake and sort of absorb the heat and irradiate. It's going to be very happy that way. Our value is not very good right now. Okay, um, so like we will be losing some of our heat down into the floor. Now for Dubai, that may not be a very big issue because the ground is actually pretty hot most of the time. So I'm not too awfully worried. But you may want to add another layer in there with some insulation. In fact, that's one of the things we often do is we'll add some insulation under the concrete just to sort of break that so it doesn't have that. But I'll just leave it this right now because, again, I'm going to allow for some improvement. Say OK. OK. Now I'm going to place this by hanging onto my walls. I'll choose the wall here. Not the fatal error. No. That hurts. I'm going to see how fatal this was. If it was really fatal, as it was, I'll have to go back. Okay. Treat this as your opportunity to catch up. Because even as I am going to go through and recreate this, the next thing I'm going to do is going to put a roof on the top of it. So put a little roof on it with like a one foot overhang or something like that. Okay. Get yourself caught up, and I'll catch up to you, and we'll, we'll all meet in about two minutes. I guess that proved that point about saving. What I always tend to say, and I don't always do it, is. Only work as long as you're willing to lose your work <laughs> without saving, because uh, it's just software. I just realized, your building says HLS. You're trying to send us a coded message in there somewhere. Hmm. Okay, so again, we're back over here. Make it 14 feet. Make it Dubai. Little section. Put ourselves on the coast there. We're in the high rent district. Come over here. Get myself a wall. Say brick on stone. Yep, da, 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 da. Over here. Excellent. Okay, a couple windows. little curtain wall, and then I think I am going to do a save. <laughs> Let me ad advocate that you do the same. <laughs> and here and here. Let's go to storefront. OK, almost back. Save this away. And put this, I'll put it in my session six folder. Okay, sample building for analysis. Okay, let's put that floor under, I'll put the roof on, and we will all be back together. Okay, architecture, a little bit of floor action. conveniently, or not so conveniently, got lost last time was right here. 
just a little clue for if you remember from uh, 120A, that whole notion of kind of grabbing right around these uh, curve walls is always a little bit funky because it offsets by an inch and it's just not worth doing that. So what I'll usually do is TR trim and get the pink line from these two sides and bring that together as what I'll call a hard line as opposed to following that detailed profile. Okay, looking good. I need a roof on this thing too. Let's check out that. I'll do a roof by footprint. Put it on level two. Thank you for suggesting that. We'll say, how about, oops, looks like my wall isn't currently at level two because I forgot to change that parameter. That'll fix that in a second. Um, what do I got here? Let me do my nice, oh, I'll go for the wood rafter, insulated. What does that got? That has an R value of 57. That's pretty good looking. I will choose a little one foot overhang. Now, that's not really well or by design. We should, we're going to learn to think about kind of designing the overhangs on the different sides of the building a little bit differently. Let me trim those two corners again. Now you'll notice currently this is all set up so that it's going to slope from all the sides. If I don't want it to slope, I want it to be flat, I can do it two ways. I can either choose all those lines and turn off to find slope, and that'll work. Or I could go through and just assign a slope of zero to it. That'll work too. Okay, so there's my little building. It's pretty boring, but it'll get the job done. Okay, let me save that away. Now, as we go through and think about analysis, there's two concepts that are going to be helpful. And we need the floor and the roof in close space. A room will be very helpful from a daylighting standpoint. And a space, which is amazingly like a room, but has a little information about how the room is actually used, is useful from a, uh, the standpoint of um, like energy analysis and calculating heat loads. So I'm going to go to rooms. Now you'll notice by default rooms only go up to 10 feet and I want to increase that always so that it goes up and hits the roof. So since I'm at 12 feet, I'm going to give it a number at least 12 feet. If I give it a higher number like 15, that's actually okay because what will happen is when it hits the roof, it'll stop. It'll catch it there. So I definitely want to put a room in there. Now, spaces are amazingly similar. You sort of want them to be in a room and area, but they're not. They actually live under Analyze. And here's the Space tool. We're going to put it in there. The same sort of rule applies. In fact, you can even say Place Spaces Automatically. It'll do a pretty good job of that. The big difference about spaces and rooms is that spaces, and let's see if I can grab it again. You're in there somewhere. Well, that's the room. I get the space. I thought I got the space. Let me do this. I will select it all and filter to get the space. <laughs> The nice thing about spaces, though, is they have this other information. What is the conditioning type? Is it heated and cooled or heated only? How is it used? Is it a classroom? Is it a commercial space? Whatever it is. And oh, I'll change that to like some sort of commercial space. We'll pull on down. And like a specialty store, sales area, retail. Let's go for that. Notice that it has a certain amount of area oops, per square foot or per person. And that's going to be useful to us. Pop back up. Because the number of people and how many people are occupying that space makes a big difference in terms of how much energy it's going to take to heat and cool that place. Okay, so I'll save this away and we're ready to go. Now, for the three types of analysis we're going to take a look at today, which are heating, cooling, lighting, and solar analysis, which are all on the Analyze tab, you see they all sort of live under something called Insight 360. And that's a new thing. So if you took the class before, that may not be familiar to you. We used to have daylighting separate, we have energy separate. They're all integrated now together into a single interface called Insight 360. And when you, you run it and you see what it actually does, We'll see why it actually adds a lot of insight to helping you make decisions. That's really what it's all about. 
It's trying to give you a lot of information to help you just really make some pretty good uh, sensitivity analysis analyses. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to just as a starting point say generate insight because it takes a few moments to do it. So let's let it just kind of cook away in the background. Okay, let us go ahead and start then. I'm going to flip back over to my little uh, mind map with solar and think about that. As we're thinking about the sun and how the sun's hitting our building, there's really two types of analysis that are sort of very good to work with. We can do what I call sun and shadow studies, where we just understand from the way the building's oriented, how the sun is hitting it at all the different times of the day and times of the year. Okay, and let's start by looking at that. Great. It's just kind of working in the background. In terms of sun and shadow, um, by default, what's considered the project south, which is the bottom of the screen versus the project north, is facing towards the uh, compass south. Okay? But you can change that. If you don't want that to be the south, that your building actually is oriented 30 degrees off, 40 degrees off, or something like that, we can change that. And how we do that is we take a look at this in the, for the plan. It says that this plan is oriented towards Project North, and that's kind of good. Level 1 is oriented towards Project North. Often we like things towards Project North because it's easier to draft when everything is orthogonal and the XY sort of lines up with where you want. If your building is going to be oriented a little bit on site, the thing to do is to duplicate one of the levels. It doesn't really matter which of the levels. I'm going to rename that and just call that true north. And I'm going to have a view where, and we're only going to use it for a very limited set of things, I'm going to change it so that the drawing is shown as true north as opposed to project north. Now, so far, this view looks just the same as the other one, because project north and true north are aligned to each other. There really is no change right now. But if I want to reorient the building a little, what I can do is manage and say under position, I can say rotate true north, and then I can swing an arc to reorient the building slightly. Okay, so now what you're looking at is the bottom of the screen is south, the building is actually facing to the southeast a little bit, or the southwest, whatever it is. So you can orient it that way. That little swing, that 30 degree swing, actually does make a difference in terms of you know, the energy performance. You'll find that whether we have the building facing southeast or southwest can make a very big difference in terms of how much sun is being absorbed. The south tends to get a lot of sun throughout the day, but it turns out southwest probably gets, I don't want to say even more sun, it gets a very intense kind of sun late in the afternoon. So late afternoon sun where the building's already hot often is kind of a very hard thing you have to mitigate against. So we have true north. If I go back to level one, it's just going to be kind of project north. But the nice thing about setting the true north is now when we show the sun and the shadows, it'll be accurate. So the sh they'll always kind of show the way they need to be. So to sort of see sun and uh, solar analysis and how that works, go to the 3D view. You might want to zoom out a little. And what you can do is turn on some shadows. That's one of the little widgets down at the bottom of the screen. It's kind of shadows on or shadows off. But maybe even before we turn on the shadows, it'd be good to sort of understand where the sun is in the sky right now. So right next to it, you'll find something that looks like a little sun, the X next to it. Turn on the sun path. Okay, And we'll use the specified project location and date. Okay. There you have a little heliodon that's showing the sun in the sky. And let's kind of talk about the sun in the sky and what it's doing. So that sun is actually showing the path for a specific time and uh, or actually day or in the year. And the sun is sort of located kind of at a current point in time. I'll turn on the shadows now. Yeah. So here we are, we're January 21st in Dubai. 
That's the southern orientation. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, here's what's happening with the sun. So you can start to see a little about where the shadows are cast off the building. You can start to see relative to the windows where the sun is coming into the building, where it might be heating up your concrete and uh, kind of adding to your heating loads. Okay. As you think about the sun and how it's located, it makes a very big difference what time of the year you're looking at, especially if you get further and further away from the equator. If you're right on the equator, it doesn't make nearly as big a difference. But you'll see if I go to June, somewhere around the solstice, okay, you get what are called very shallow or short shadows because the sun is considered to be very high in the sky. If instead you go to December, you get longer shadows because the sun is much further down in the sky. So it's helpful to go ahead and look at different times of the year and just see where the shadows are falling at different times of the day so you can start to understand. You know, when you have heating loads, are you getting sun? Are you shading from sun? You know, what can you do? So for example, if I look at this building right now and I go back to June, okay? You see those southern windows, even though I have an awful lot of like windows on the south side, they're really not getting very much sun, okay, which is kind of okay. We still have to worry about heat flowing through the windows conductively, but we don't have a whole lot of solar radiation because we have just a little bit of overhang on them. If I change that around to different times of the day, let's look at nine in the morning. You see there I have some sun coming in. I get up to 11 in the morning, okay, the sun's starting to get blocked out. I start getting to like at 3 in the afternoon or something like that, the sun's over there, that's 3 in the morning. That's not very good. Okay, and now we're on the back side of the building again, we're not worrying about the sun too much. Now, this whole issue of the sun, you can go ahead and work with it kind of one step at a time, just kind of stepping through one time at a, or, and kind of evaluate. Or you can set up something called a solar study. Let me kind of show you what that looks like. Under sun, you can choose sun settings. And sun settings for Dubai, okay, it's currently set to a specific point in time. It says still, so it's a specific time right now. If I want to look at a single day or multiple days, what I can do is choose one of the other periods. If we want to say single day, we can even go through and span it. Let me choose a one day solar study. Okay. It'll just go from 10 till 4. I can say sunrise to sunset if I want to get the full range of time. Say OK. OK, and so far it doesn't look very different. But what you can do is now say, preview the solar study. And there's this little uh, widget up in the options bar, which lets you play from early in the morning. Let's see if it does it. There we go. And the sun kind of coming over into the evening. So you can start to simulate and sort of see what's going on with the sun. So just even in Revit, just this whole idea of kind of doing these sun studies and kind of working your way through. Go back to the beginning. Is actually very useful for giving you a little bit of insight. Okay, so doing sun studies in Revit is actually kind of really easy to do. Another thing you can do, if you're sort of wondering about, you know, is the sun penetrating your building, how deep is it getting, and all that, is you can go through and turn on the section box. See where that is? There it is. And maybe you can click on the section box and use it to basically uh, cut some sort of, uh, like, section through the building. I'm trying to select my section box and not having a very good time. Oh, I think it's because I'm still previewing my sun study. Let me go ahead and turn that off. What are you still doing? Preview, preview, preview. I want to turn that off. That's turning it on. I want to turn that thing off. Should I sun path off? That'll work. 
Nope, it's still up there. Okay, what do I got to do? How do I turn off the sun study? How do I turn off the sun study? <laughs> turn off the shadows. Nope. That's a very interesting hole. I know somewhere in here, one of the, the buttons sitting here on the screen that's somehow saying turn off the solar study, and I'm just not finding it now. I just don't see it. Does anyone see a way to turn off a sun solar study? Is that supposed to be like something? There's a button in here somewhere. I just don't see it. No. Let's do this. Let's change the sun studies back to still. Okay, that'll work. There's a more efficient way of doing that. I'm just not sure what it is right off end. Okay. Come back in here. I'll sort of cut through my building a little bit. What I mean about doing this is if you cut through the building, can you go zooming on in there? You might actually be able to get sort of some very good insights. So again, if I say turn on the shadows, or if I turn on the sun path, you can still adjust it for different points in time. So you can sort of see at 11 in the morning, that's 11 p.m. Yeah, how deep the sun's going to penetrate. You can start to sort of see inside your building. A very useful thing to do. You can do that either in the shaded view. You can render that view, and it will actually look quite interesting. So you can just sort of understand the sun and shadows this way, and that's a really good starting point. But let me show you another tool that's available, and it's called uh, solar radiation analysis. And if you've taken any of the building energy classes and thought about energy efficient buildings, and I thought it all about solar panels and trying to kind of maximize the potential for collecting solar energy. This tool is really good for that. Let me go ahead and turn off the section box because I don't want to have that on. I want to see the entire building. Okay, so here's my entire building. You can sort of see the sun in the sky now. Okay, if I want to start to understand the solar potential for the building, what I do is go to Analyze, and you'll find the solar tool. Okay. And what that's going to do, it'll let us either see, we can see the cumulative solar radiation on any of the surfaces, which might be good if you're trying to put solar panels on and you want to figure out how to orient them or where to place them to get the maximum amount of solar energy. It can also show you the peak or the average solar radiation. You might want to do something like that for the windows or something like that, because you can start to figure out really which of the windows get the strongest sun. Okay. And that could help you decide which ones need extra shading features or extra coatings inside the glass to go ahead and cut down on the amount of solar radiation that's absorbed. But it all starts with, let's turn on solar. Okay, it, does everyone have that tool? I should ask that. Is that showing up in your rivet? Showing up in yours, Gustavo? Do you have under analyze something called solar? Yeah. Okay, excellent. You good? Okay. If you all have that, here's how it basically works. You can go ahead and choose different types of studies. Let's go ahead and see what's available under there. I think I was playing around, so I sort of set a different time frame. I'm just going to change it to solar energy, the annual photovoltaic potential. Okay, I can choose all the roof surfaces, okay, which is if I just want to think about roofs, fine. If you want to choose some more surfaces, you want to sort of understand the wall surfaces too, we'll choose them also. So how you do that is you pull on down and you say, oh, user selection. Okay. And we're now in a mode. Notice there's a little finish and a cancel up here in the upper left-hand corner. What we're going to do is basically click on all the different surfaces we want to have reported okay, and computed. And then when we're done, we're going to finish. So what it does is it's currently got the roof. If I want to get that wall and this wall and that wall, I can even get some of these uh, roofs or these windows. In fact, let me try this. Let's see if this will actually work. Can I do a big drag? I can do a big drag. 
Now, doing a big drag is okay for what we're doing, because we have a very small building and we have that many services. If you had a gigantic building, you probably wouldn't want to do a big drag. Okay, but we'll go through and think about that. Okay, notice it's gonna basically report back to us some sort of information about basically what we have selected. I think they have about 500 meters cubed selected. Oh, let me finish. It'll change that number. Okay. As well as um, information. What I'm going to do is flip down the little results and switch it over as opposed to kilowatt hours per meter uh, squared. I'll change it to BTUs per foot squared. Or you could change it to watt hours. It's really whatever uh, kind of system is the one that sort of feels most familiar to you. Okay. When you are ready to analyze, click. the update button. What it's going to do is go off and do some calculations. Okay, it's going to go do it for the whole year. It's got a few surfaces in here, so it's doing a fair amount of work. Okay, it's going ahead and plotting things. I can see that, boy, if I did photovoltaic uh, energy production, I have a certain amount of energy savings that I can go through and achieve. I have a certain amount of area that's considered good and a certain payback period about like, what would be useful. So this is just for the solar analysis for the annual PEB. That's a certain type of thing that's specifically looking at the photovoltaic potential. But let's take a look at that. I'm going to turn off the sun path just because I think it's kind of cluttering up our view a little bit right now. Put that over there. Okay. If you look at the building, and you can zoom on in there and take a closer look, you start to see sort of, uh, where'd it go? I should see my results. Did it update itself? Do that again. Okay, but it's basically gonna give you a color-coded version of the building that's gonna show you on the building just really, uh, what is that full take? Go back and kind of like uh, okay. Let me ask you, how are you guys doing on your side? Are you getting some sort of results? Are you seeing some sort of color coding? Yes. Is that new? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if I look at my building here in Dubai, and they just keep on changing things all the time off the lobby. It's hard to keep up with. If I do that, I have a little scale over here. Zooming now, let me pan it over a little bit. Zoom out. You'll see there's different surfaces that have better and worse potential. You'll sort of see that the roof itself, let me go ahead and close up this little window right now, has the best potential. It has a certain watt hours per meter square that we could achieve there. The front walls have a certain potential. It's kind of interesting, but the time we get back to the corners of the front walls, you don't actually have much potential. What tends to be happening is, as the sun is moving over the building later in the day, this wing of the building is actually shading the building, so you're losing some potential in that front corner just because it's kind of in the crook or the elbow, you're not really seeing it. You can sort of see that over here, we get fairly good potential on the front of the building. If we orbit around, though, you'll see that it's not what it considers to be no potential on the back, or at least it's less potential than we currently have the analysis set up to go ahead and highlight with the color. Okay. I'm going to go and try a slightly different analysis to kind of like uh, show something different. Let's go ahead and do a study. Let's see what I have available in here. I just want to use the sun settings. That's fine. I have the analysis grid. That's fine. In terms of the results, Let's say solar annual, like that. So right now, what it has been doing is it's been biasing it by the notion of being able to pay back for the photovoltaic panels, okay, based on some assumptions. If I just change it to this, it won't be doing that. It'll just sort of show us colors on all the different surfaces so you can get sort of a comparative idea of really uh, what is the photo or the solar potential on all those different surfaces. Let's do that. It's going to again do its calculations. It's also, if you're going to want, it'll export a CSV file. So if you like to kind of grab a lot of detailed data and put it in Excel to do an analysis of all sorts of points all over the grid, you can do that. Okay. 
But here's what we know right now. Let's see what it looks like on the back side. Because that doesn't look very interesting on that side. I think my scale is funny in terms of doing it. Notice the windows aren't collecting anything. Let me go back to the solar again and choose a different scale. Because I think it's just, that must be putting a minimum threshold here. Solar annual insulation. Let's try that. Oh, that's a little bit better. Yep, that was that one. I guess these are different minimal thresholds. This is solar analysis default. Okay, that's kind of what I'm looking for. This one basically shows if you sort of looked at all those different surfaces and which had the greatest potential, the roof clearly has the best, these front walls are sort of green, they're somewhere in the middle, there's actually a scale over here which is showing the potential, they're sort of in the middle. If I go back to the back side of the building though, You'll see there's very little potential back there. It's actually kind of dark back over there. A little bit darker on the green. Okay. We can set this up for specific times of the year. We can set it up so that if we, for example, thought about the building having different uh, features. For example, if we extended the roof out further or pulled the roof back or tilted the walls or something like that, all being able to kind of calculate the solar potential. So, this is a really good tool for starting to get some insight about really, you know, what is having an impact or not having an impact. So for example, if I didn't want all that solar energy on the front of the building, what I could do is, let me just take out the analysis results, I just backspace them out. I'll grab that roof, I'll edit its footprint, put a big overhang on the building extreme as an overhang goes. But again, if I run that solar analysis, let's see what happens now. if it did. What am I seeing? I have to redo that again. I think since I deleted the analysis, I might be confused right now. Let's try that again. Nope. Hmm. I might have to redo that again from scratch. Well, ignore that for now. I'm going to take it back to the other shape so we can sort of see what the building used to look like. Okay, solar is the first piece of all this, so definitely go and think about solar. I'll fumble with software the way I always do. Okay, other types of analysis that are available are daylighting. We sort of looked at daylighting a little bit last time. Daylighting is really all about how are we doing in terms of the lighting levels across the entire floor. And we're going to talk about daylighting some more next time in detail. But Daylighting in general is we're trying to get, you know, you use the daylighting that's coming in through the windows as much as possible to get a good lighting level throughout the building and within a range that's considered to be acceptable and good for working. Um, in terms of lighting in general, daylighting and electrical, there's all sorts of rules we have about really how much lighting need to be on work surfaces that are depending on the type of job you're doing, how old you are, how acute your eyes are, how fine the work is. And there's these different levels of lighting. And we'll usually talk about in terms of lumens. For things like hallways, where we sort of are moving through, but we don't really need to stay and do any work, they tend to be fairly low, like 20, 30, 40 lumens. For working here on our desks, it might be 80 or 90 lumens. If we start, actually, uh, I think you're about to do this in 256. You know, go through the different lighting, lighting levels you're trying to achieve. If it starts getting to be much higher than that, it starts getting to be almost too bright. Like sitting out in direct sunlight is almost too bright to do your work. There's so much glare, the 
this is hard on your eyes. You sort of actually get very tired doing that. So there's sort of a level we're trying to achieve. And the way the daylighting analysis works here is if you choose the lighting tool and say you want to do a new lighting analysis, it sends it off to the cloud, creates a color map for you of how this building is doing. So let me just say continue. It's going to basically compute at like about two feet off the floor what the lighting level is throughout that building. This whole notion of what type of analysis to do, right now we're going to do a lead analysis which says on, November, on September 21st, these two times of the day, figure out the lighting levels and is it within these sort of prescribed thresholds? Is it sort of within that range? And if I think it's 85%, I'll look at the exact number, is within that range, then you know, the building is considered to pass lead daylighting and we'll get some lead daylighting credits. Okay, so that's the initial kind of analysis we'll do. The same tool will be used for doing analysis of lighting on any particular day or time. We can also do it so that it incorporates the natural lights and the electrical lights working together. So you can really use this to go through and do very detailed lighting analysis. For right now, let me just start that. We'll let that kind of cook away in the background. Okay. Because the third thing I want to show you is just the whole heating and cooling load analysis. Because we didn't actually put all that much information into our building. You know, so far we put in some walls, we put in some windows, that's all okay. And you might wonder if we could go through and figure out the information we need for sizing up a heating and cooling system. And the answer is yes, you can. So because we put a space in there, we have a certain number of square footage, we have thermal properties on all the outside walls, on the windows, on the roof and all that and we know sort of what's going on in terms of how much heat is being generated inside the building, okay, you can go ahead and use Energy Plus, which some of you may be used to using, to go through and create a report that'll sort of compute for you just really what the heating and cooling loads are. So what I just did is kind of click the Energy Plus heating and cooling button. It's going through and doing some calculations using Energy Plus right now. So using your building and your building model and the values there, sort of feeding it into the Energy Plus simulation so that uh, you can go through and take advantage of its calculation engine. And let's see what it does. Well, that's not a good thing. Returning an error, I don't like that. I'm gonna try it one more time. And then say that I'm just having bad software luck today. Let's see if any of you can get that here. Okay. The final thing we're going to look at, though, is just something called Insight 360. And you might remember if we were uh, back to in 120A, 220A, yep, still got a server, it's not an error, so I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. In 120A, 220A, we took a building like this, and we ran what was called a uh, building element energy analysis on it. We ran a report that basically showed for the square footage in this use, here's the amount of energy in use intensity, and here's the heating and cooling that's passing out through the windows, the doors, all the different surfaces. So it could actually give us a little bit of information to uh, like decide how we want to sort of improve on the building and make it a little bit better. What Insight does is very similar. It uses the same calculation engine in the background. It just presents it to you in a different way. So let me open Insight 360 and just show you how the information is presented to you. It's a little bit different. You might remember that in the whole world of like a green building studio or the energy analysis which was being done, you know, it was always a range of values that were computed for you. So given the building, the shape, the form, and where you are, there's always a couple of different things you can sort of look at. At some level, you have a certain energy use intensity that you're achieving right now, which is kind of a worst case and a best case, and you want to try to figure out where you're going to end up between. Right now you see that we're actually, just based on the assumptions we've put in so far, very close to the guidelines given by ASHRAE 90.1. We're currently at about a 170 per square foot per year, and to meet that standard we get 1.64. Okay. 
what all these different little tiles in the interface are doing for us is really just starting to give us a little bit of feedback about what we could change in the building that might have an impact. So for example, if I look down at something like uh, the HVAC system that we're using right now, okay, the HVAC system, would, HVAC system would have an impact of going anywhere from using an ASHRAE heat pump, kind of a standard one, okay, of being, oh, somewhere a little more expensive than where we are right now, all the way down to a high efficiency one down on this end, subtracting almost 0.5, okay, so if I pull down the range to sort of a more efficient system or range of systems, you'll see what I'm doing is lowering the potential values of the energy use intensity. Okay, so what that told me is that just by going ahead and changing around the efficiency of my heating and cooling system, I can actually get down within the standards without adding insulation, without changing the windows, just by making kind of a small change to the efficiency of the system. And that's really sort of the point about this. Let me kind of explain this whole system. The idea of this whole system of Insight 360 is really just to give you insight, give you some sensitivity feedback about what's going to make the biggest difference. So we sort of pulled down and sort of went to a more efficient HVAC system to achieve some efficiency. Let's take a look at the lighting efficiency. That's one that's always kind of incredibly impactful, but you are typically not aware of how impactful. So here, we have different lighting efficiencies. The difference here is everywhere from sort of very conventional bulbs down to like LED bulbs, which are very, very efficient. So if I just went through and said, I lowered the density, okay, so I'm using more efficient lights, okay, I can actually have a huge impact on the EUI. Now, I want to contrast that to, for example, Oh, like roof construction, because you say, oh, you know, I'm going to put a green roof on, I'm going to ultra insulate the roof. If you look at that, uninsulated is pretty bad, but the difference between R10 and R60 is negligible. So it may be worthwhile to go to an R60 if you have sort of another consideration, but by doing that, you're not saving a whole lot of extra energy. So. I could even back off the insulation quite a bit and really have very little impact on things. The same sort of thing about the walls. The walls you're going to find out right now are probably pretty well insulated. Wall construction, I have different levels anywhere from R2, R13 to R12.5. It's not making a very big difference one way or the other. So those are things not to focus on so much. Building orientation, I could try reorienting it, but again, that's not going to affect it very much. So the idea is to go through and use these sorts of different tools and try to figure out where is it that you can make the biggest difference. There's a whole thing in here in terms of how often, how soon our full of the tank panels have to pay back. If I require them to pay back in 10 years, it's much less efficient. If I can allow that it could pay back over 20 or 30 years, we can really drop that down. Okay. At which point, we're quite a bit below the ASHRAE limit, and we have really kind of a pretty efficient building in the scheme of things. So I just want to like sort of um, just kind of make you aware of this, because this kind of sensitivity analysis can really help guide you to spending your time on the most effective things and ignoring the things that don't really make that big a difference. Because I think one of the hardest things we have in general with energy analysis, there's so many variables. It's like shooting in the dark to figure out the ones that will really make the impact. Okay. Whereas this insight tool, I think, does a pretty good job of helping guiding you towards where you can so that uh, you're not wasting time and money. You're really focusing on where it does the best. Okay, let us pause and adjourn there for today. Um, again, we're stopping short today, but we will get back to our normal schedule uh, next week. Um, so please uh, just get ready, and I'm going to see a couple of you a little bit later this afternoon in terms of uh, getting set up with stuff. Um, I don't know. We will just uh, check in with you individually later. In the meantime, for everyone, just keep plugging away on your projects and moving them along so that uh, you can move beyond that sort of basic layout and start thinking about some of these envelope issues.